Hi, everyone. I know we're going to wait a few seconds before we jump in as everyone rolls in. Um, while we're waiting for that, uh, before we jump in, we just wanted to say that you we will be accepting questions throughout the presentation uh, that we'll be answering, and you guys can all enter that through the chat uh, on the side. Uh, so we'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation. Another way to uh, engage during the presentation will also be we'll have a few polls throughout as well. Okay, so my name is Audrey Merkel and uh, Tom O'Day and I will be presenting today on the FTC's non-compete rule uh, and how that applies to healthcare employers uh, as well as some strategies uh, that healthcare employers can utilize while we're waiting for the non-compete rule uh, to be enacted. So a few things that we'll be going over today are the impact of the FTC's ban on nonprofits uh, versus the impact on for-profit entities, um, because though even though right now it only applies to for-profit entities, uh, we do believe the rule is telling uh, what may be forthcoming uh, for all uh, entities in terms of non-compete agreements. Uh, we'll be doing an overview of restrictive covenants and how you can utilize uh, various restrictive covenants even with this ban on non-competes. Uh, we'll then be diving into the final rule, um, providing the potential impact on the healthcare industry. Uh, and then last, we'll walk through what to expect next and proactive steps you can be taking in the interim. Okay, starting off now with a poll question. Um, do you currently use a separate standalone agreement to protect non-trade secret confidential information? I believe that's live now. Um, so if you can all go ahead uh, and answer that question. And there's a distinction here in this question while we watch it come through for trade secrets. That's a separate protection, but for confidential information that could be not a trade secret, you might want to take steps to protect that as well. So two separate concepts there. All right, well, we've got some a good uh, rate of people who have responded. Oh, okay, so it looks like almost split 50-50. Um, so that's interesting and good to know uh, for the remainder of um, this presentation to keep in mind. Um, okay, so the next poll question, do you currently have a patient resident client non-solicitation restriction with any of your employees? We go ahead and take a moment to respond to that one. I'm going to guess less than 20% have a current restriction in place. Okay. Let's go see. Looks like majority of people have responded. So almost 70% have current non solicitation restrictions. Interesting. Okay. 
So now we'll get into our presentation, uh, starting off with the impact that the role has on nonprofits uh, versus for profits. So for the role, the FTC's uh, does carve the FTC's final role does carve out an exception for true nonprofit healthcare organizations. And true nonprofit healthcare organizations means that in practice, um, meaning that what their goals are and whether or not they receive profits um, does result in them being a non a true nonprofit. So it doesn't just come down to whether or not um, they're tax exempt. Um, and if they are a true nonprofit, that then allows them to continue using non competes. So not all entities that are claiming a tax exempt status as nonprofits fall outside of the FTC's jurisdiction. So if entities are claiming a tax exempt status um, and are in fact profit making enterprises, again, based on their actual operations and goals, um, those 501c tax exempt entities would still be covered by the final rule and therefore would not be able to utilize non-competes. So the example, while, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I was going to say the example that the FTC gave in their their final rule commentary was a physician group that may be organized as a nonprofit organization, but the purpose of the physician group is to generate revenue for those physicians who make up as individual members the group itself. So that's an example of one of those potentially tax exempt organizations that the FTC would say is not truly nonprofit for purposes of this rule. Right. So while hospitals and healthcare entities that are claiming the tax exempt status as nonprofits do not necessarily fall outside of the jurisdiction, the ban on non compete agreements does not apply to hospitals and healthcare entities that are these true nonprofits. So some implications of the final rule on nonprofits is that the final rule on non-competes does not currently apply to nonprofit organizations, but the final rule does provide insight into the FTC's evolving perspective on non-compete agreements. So it suggests an increased scrutiny and potential future regulation for these true nonprofits that again, though right now are excluded from this final rule. Um, we do think it's telling on what could um, potentially happen in the future. And this is because there are these changing views uh, and that the rule does highlight a shift in how non-compete agreements are viewed. There seems to be a growing concern about the impact on worker mobility and really creating this free market of competition um, that they never want uh, to prohibit employees from being able to go to different employers or start their own businesses and similarly don't want employers to be prohibited or worried about um, hiring certain employees because of these agreements. So although right now nonprofits are not affected, uh, the principles and rationale that are found within this new regulation could eventually lead um, to broader rules um, that could impact nonprofits. Again, just based on the trajectory and what we've been seeing, uh, especially even before uh, the FTC's final rule, we are seeing a trend in states starting to become more restrictive in what industries uh, employees could have non-competes in um, or just avoiding them altogether. Um, nonprofit organizations, uh, as a result, should stay informed uh, not only on the FTC rule and how it could evolve, um, but also uh, what court decisions are coming out when the rule is being challenged. Um, nonprofits may need to reassess their employment practices and legal strategies uh, so they can better align with potential future regulations. So really taking the time now to assess what agreements you have in place with your employees and really staying up to date um, with the, the current regulations and specifically um, the state that you reside in and those statutes. And I think the the I that was included there in that slide is really indicative of employment relations as well. There's the legal 
concept of this. There are the policy making um, aspects of non-compete law, but then there's just the general human resources employment relations aspect. And I think employees feel more emboldened to say no to a non-compete restriction, either on the front end as they're coming in, looking at future employment, or even as a current employee, if you were to try and place something in front of them. And that's driven by the labor market as it's been in the last four or five years where it's been difficult to attract employees. And generally just because of the regulatory environment, all of the negative press and general media attention that non-compete agreements are getting, I think it's becoming harder to enforce those from a human relations, employment relations standpoint. Through the different types of protections that you can put in place in order to better protect your organization. And it's really a balance of whether or not these are the types of things that you've already got in place. If you already have them in place, whether or not they are enforceable and done correctly. If you don't have them in place, whether there's something that you do want to put in place for future use as an organization in order to protect your interests and the interests of those that you serve. So the first protection is already provided for you. You have a protection as an organization against an individual taking your trade secrets of the organization. And those are valuable assets of yours that you take steps to restrict access to. They're important such that to the extent they were shared with other organizations, there would be some detrimental benefit to, to you in that sharing of the information. And there's rules around what becomes or does not become a trade secret. Generally, if you take steps to limit access to it, if you take steps to protect that information, if it is essential to your organization, it could be and serve as a trade secret, that's protected under federal and state laws. No matter what you do, you don't need a contract in place in order to protect that. We've got HIPAA protections, state law protections, private uh, patient health information protections that are also part of federal and state law that are in place. You don't need to put anything in addition in place in order to protect those interests, but those are things that you can continue to emphasize in this environment of employees moving from one position to another, from one employer to another. You can always continue to emphasize those trade secrets, HIPAA protections, and other patient health information protections that apply to all those employees. The next four are levels of contractual restrictions that you can put in place with your employees. The first being a confidentiality or a non-disclosure agreement. And this would protect information that doesn't fall into the category of a trade secret for one reason or another, but it's still important to your organization. It's things like customer, patient, member, resident lists. It's things like your strategic information with respect to marketing strategy or your financial strategy moving forward. That's all confidential information important to you as an organization, but it might not yet draw the attention or be categorized as a trade secret. Those are the kinds of things that you want to protect in a separate standalone contractual agreement with your employees to make sure that they don't walk out the door with that information and take it to a competitor of yours down the street. The next level of contractual restriction would be a non-solicitation restriction for an employee so that they can't solicit their coworkers or former employees with whom they worked. And this is something that's an anti-rating provision is what it might be called. Again, a contractual provision that you wanna have as a separate standalone document that's not included in an employee handbook or some other kind of policy that applies to everyone. You want this to be a separate contractual restriction. The third type of contractual restriction is a non-solicitation restriction with respect to patients or residents, members, customers, whatever you call the clientele that you serve. That prohibits the employee for some period of time after they leave employment from directly or indirectly soliciting those patients or residents or members after they leave employment. And then the final fifth, fourth type of general contractual restriction that you can put in place has to do with a geographic restriction. And that's the type of restriction, a typical, what would be known as a, a typical non-compete restriction that says you can't provide services as a dentist or as a pediatrician within a 25 mile radius of the office from which you worked at this address, for example. Now, 
oftentimes the federal government confuses and just lumps all of these types of protections into what they call a non-compete agreement. And there is important distinction between all of these different types. The FTC rule um, that they've passed and that we'll, we'll talk about throughout today and will go into effect potentially later in the fall is focused on the last that's listed there, the geographic restrictions. The FTC rule doesn't touch patient or member or resident non-solicitation restrictions. It doesn't touch employee non-solicitation restrictions. It doesn't touch confidentiality or non-disclosure restrictions if they're done the right way. And Audrey's gonna talk about how the FTC has warned if you use those types of agreements in an inappropriate way to keep someone from going to a place where they want to go within a geography, then they can fall into the scope of what we, the FTC, consider to be unenforceable and inappropriate. But if done right, organizations can, in each of those top four steps, continue to use those protections in order to make sure that your interests as an organization are protected. And we'll dig into, at the end, some of the practical implications of that as we move into it. So now we're going to dive into the final rule uh, that bans non-competes. So first, just a little bit of background is that non-competes agreements are governed by state statute or common law. So that's why it's really important that you take the time to understand what your state says about non-competes, as well as other restrictive covenants uh, in terms of geographic scope, um, consideration, notice requirements. Um, it really varies greatly from state to state, um, not only with statutes, but also needing to look at common law to see what courts have said um, and what do they find to be uh, permissible uh, when it comes to each of those categories for restrictive covenants. Um, some states, for example, like California, have adopted statutes that render non-compete agreements almost uh, all void uh, for nearly all employees um, with very limited exceptions. Uh, other states have also enacted restrictive covenant statutes that render non-compete clauses unenforceable, um, but that depends, uh, again, on the impacted worker's earnings. Uh, some other uh, factors to consider would be consideration. So what did you give in exchange for the employee signing the restrictive covenant? Uh, there are various notice requirements and other factors that can be at play um, that you'll need to be considering if you do um, ask an employee to enter into one of those restrictive covenant uh, agreements that Tom discussed. Uh, other states have also introduced or enacted bans for certain industries, uh, such as healthcare workers. Um, so really just making sure you stay up to date on what statutes, if not um, have been already passed, but are in that process of being enacted. So the FTC ban this started uh, last year, early last year, where the FTC uh, proposed this rule that would ban all non-competes. Um, that uh, the process for doing that was then this comment period, uh, in where anyone from the public can um, file a comment, and it received over twenty-six thousand on the proposed rule. Uh, with over 25,000 of those comments being in support of the ban. So very telling in terms of how the public uh, is viewing uh, non-competes and uh, whether they think that they should continue to be utilized. Uh, then uh, earlier this year, the FTC uh, finally issued a decision uh, where it um, issued a final rule, uh, as we know it uh, today, that would virtually ban all non-compete agreements for nearly all workers, again, for for-profit entities. Uh, there are some exceptions, one of which we'll uh, discuss uh, next, but in the final rule, the commission uh, determined that it's an unfair method of competition to be utilizing these types of restrictive covenants, and as a result, it violates Section 5 of the FTC Act uh, for employers to be entering into these non-competes with its workers. 
um, and forcing them uh, to sign certain non-competes. Um, again, it all comes back to the idea that uh, we want the um, employees and employers to be able to move freely in the markets. Um, and this is attempting to um, get rid of any sort of restrictions. Um, as we know, too, it received a lot of pushback almost immediately. And we anticipate that it will continue to face a lot of pushback um, from both the business community as well as healthcare entities. And this is of course because um, these industries rely so heavily on these types of restrictive covenants. Uh, right now, the next kind of deadline to be aware of is that September 4th uh, is when this rule should become effective. However, there are various challenges to it right now that could uh, impact that date um, and result in it not becoming effective. So how does the FTC define a non-compete? The Act uh, defines a non-competition clause as a contractual term that prohibits, penalizes for, or functions to prevent a worker from seeking or accepting work um, from a different person or business um, that's in competition with uh, the employer that the employee entered into the non-compete agreement with. Um, so though it's typically limited in geographic scope, uh, that can be a radius from the place of business or a territory where that employee was doing work, also typically limited in time um, tied to the last day of um, when they did work for the employer or their last point of contact with specific clients, but it needs to be tailored um, in those two different scopes. Um, Non-compete agreements, though, are not cookie cutter in any way. They can take many different forms. So some expressly prohibit a worker from seeking or accepting other work or starting a business after their employment ends, while others require a worker to pay a penalty or lose certain um, benefits that were promised to them. Other uh, restrictive covenant agreements or non-compete clauses um, have a large scope uh, of limiting activity that they function to prevent a worker from seeking or accepting other work. Um, and that's kind of what the, this ban is really trying to prevent from happening, um, where employees can just move freely as opposed to um, being so limited just because they entered into these agreements um, where they can't find other businesses or jobs to work for um, due to the agreements they entered into. So the potential impact now on other agreements is that other restrictive covenants can still be used. The final rule only restricts non-compete clauses. Um, however, if there is a non-solicitation agreement in place or a term in place or a non-disclosure agreement that functionally is equivalent to a non-compete clause, then that too uh, can be um, can fall within this FTC ban. Um, they may be viewed, and that's because they could be viewed as non-compete clauses if they are too broad, or then it results in the employee being so restricted that they cannot move freely um, to accept different uh, employment or start their own businesses. Uh, confidentiality agreements and non-solicitation of employees as well as patients will likely remain enforceable, but again, that will really depend on how they're drafted. Uh, you want to make sure that they are drafted narrowly so there can be no argument that they're so broad where it um, prevents an employee um, from being able to seek alternative employment. The rule does expressly allow employers to continue, again, utilizing these non-solicitation and confidentiality agreements, but they just can't restrict employees um, from pursuing or accepting employment elsewhere. So if the non-solicitation or confidentiality agreement does result in them impeding an in individual from finding uh, employment, it could be classified as a non-competition agreement. So it just 
these agreements can't cannot circumvent the non-competition ban just by simply calling them um, a different restrictive covenant, such as non-solicitation. Uh, following the enactment of the final rule, employers uh, should shift to using the other restrictive covenants um, and again, narrowly construing them um, or narrowly drafting them rather um, so they cannot um, be argued that they are non-competes. So some requirements and implications of the final rule is that the ban on non-competes are for all workers, including senior executives. However, one main exception is for non-compete agreements that are already in place for senior executives. However, in, in order to meet this exception, um, two factors need to be met. One is a um, total annual compensation threshold, and the other is that the position held by the senior executive is one where they have policy making authority. So that the earnings threshold uh, is at $151,164 um, is that threshold, which I'm sure many at the policy making level would meet. So the real threshold question will come down to whether or not they have policy making authority. So that's really the core of the analysis that you'll have to be um, doing when deciding whether or not you have employees with these non-competes in place um, and that they can still remain in place if this rule becomes effective. So what is policy making authority? This means that they have final authority to make policy decisions that control significant aspects of an entity. So to, to, de to determine this level of authority, entities need to conduct a thorough and factual analysis. So it's very much case by case in assessing every role individually that you think could meet um, this exception to really assess what impact the individual could have on the entire entity. So a policy making position is one in which the business, it could be the entity's president, CEO, or another equivalent um, officer or position, but they have to exercise policy making authority for the business entity. So it can't just be a subsidiary or a certain section um, or group of individuals. You, their decisions really need to be felt by the entire entity. Um, and it cannot be limited to just advising or exerting influence. Um, so it really is very fact specific um, and you'll need to assess um, the overall impact that the employee or senior executive has on the entity. And this will be the area in which the facts develop the most over the next couple months if the, if the rule goes into effect. The FTC will likely start enforcement actions. There'll be a couple that they do on the front end to highlight the fact that the rule exists and get more media attention around it. And whether um, you know a policy making exception is allowed or not allowed is very fact dependent as Audrey said. Obviously the FTC thinks in their mind that it's very limited. It is C-suite executives for the entire organization, not just a branch, not just a critical access hospital or a um, you know one location of our hospice or long-term care facility, they're thinking the entire organization. And that's where a lot of the rub is gonna play out in FTC enforcement actions and then ultimately potentially the courts. So looking now at another aspect to consider, which is notice requirements under the final rule. So employers need to provide a clear and conspicuous notice to workers that are still bound by non-compete agreements. Uh, this notice can be delivered um, by using various methods. Uh, it can be by hand, mail, email, even text message. Uh, employers may be exempt from the notice requirement though, um, if they do not have any record of how they can contact that that worker that would still be bound by an agreement. Um, and that would be if they have no record of a street address, a current telephone number, uh, or email address, or really any way to contact them. 
and the FTC has included model language in the final rule for employers to use. So that could be a good step if you want to be proactive in terms of how you can reach out to those employees or former employees um, and what's, what the FTC expects that communication to look like. Okay, and last on the final rule is what the final rule does not apply to. Um, so one main one is if there, it does not apply where a cause of action related to a non-compete accrued prior to the effective date. So if there is current litigation pending um, that revolves around the non-compete itself, um, then the final rule does not impact that decision. Uh, another big um, piece to consider is what we had already discussed in depth, which is whether your nonprofit organization is truly a nonprofit uh, and making that assessment now and doing that analysis to see whether or not um, you would fall into this exception. Another thing to keep in mind when it comes to your uh, workers and who this does apply to is that the final rule defines a worker as a natural person who works or previously worked uh, for the employer, including employees, independent contractors, and volunteers. So because it revolves around or uses the word, the phrase natural person, uh, the definition is unclear um, whether or not it applies to certain other um, positions. So a few examples, the definition is unclear for directors, members, or partners. Um, so keep that in mind when you're assessing whether or not the non-compete uh, rule ban would apply here. And then last, non-compete agreements between businesses are still enforceable, but those in franchisor or franchisee relationships are subject to state and federal laws. So again, you always want to be making sure that you're aware of where your state currently stands for um, on restrictive covenants um, and whether or not um, the agreements you have in place um, our compliance with both state and then also looking to federal law as well. The questions that came in from participants and, and certainly feel free to continue to add your questions into the chat box that you should be able to see on your screen. One question had to do with that sale of business context. And if you are an owner of an organization selling a hospice or a long-term care facility or whatever else it might be, there may be an instance where the purchaser, the buyer does require you as an individual to sign a non-compete restriction. Those are outside the scope of the FTC's rule. They, the FTC says that's not, that, that is a, a, a equal kind of position of bargaining for the two parties that are sophisticated. So they're not worried about those types of non-compete restrictions, even with the geographic restriction that's included in the sale of business. Unmuted there. So let's talk about um, healthcare and how the rule is really um, going to impact how you prepare. So first thing we've talked about, and it, it doesn't mean that, again, the nonprofit organizations aren't going to find themselves having to deal with restrictive covenant and non-compete issues, but you're not covered by this rule if you are a true nonprofit organization. So first step, undergo that analysis, determine whether or not you do um, have those, um, uh, the ability to utilize that exception and move on from it um, because of that. The other place this is really going to be effective for healthcare is in the retention space. If you make your place of business a place where the employees want to continue to stay, if you're, of course, compensation and benefits are going to play an important role in that determination for those employees, but you can take steps to create that workplace environment where you're an employer of choice. You want those employees to stay. You might invest in training programs to build that internal talent compensate or otherwise reward the employees for taking advantage of those opportunities to build their own skill sets and use those as um, effort in order to retain 
those employees who are in the workplace as well. And then, of course, you want to take those steps to make sure that you are protecting the interests that are not covered by the FTC rule, but the ones that you can still continue to take advantage of. And this, again, is a similar or the same slide that we had up earlier. But in my mind, I would put more emphasis on training for purposes of trade secrets, putting more emphasis on training for HIPAA and patient health information in the short term. Um, this fall, the all the public attention around this rule, whether it goes into effect or doesn't go into effect, can be a reason to get in front of those individual employees and make sure that they're aware of their obligations with respect to patient health information under state and federal law, as well as with respect to trade secrets of the healthcare entity, the organization itself. And again, you don't need any new contractual obligation, don't need any new restriction that you need to put in place in order to remind employees that they have those obligations under common law without a contract. I believe that every employee in an organization should have a confidentiality or a non-disclosure agreement. And we asked that question on the front end, it sounds like roughly half of the participants in this presentation use some type of separate standalone contractual requirement that employees sign on to that says they understand that they can't use non-trade secret confidential information after they leave employment with the organization. And again, I think every employee in an organization should have that restriction. I think that's fair. I think most employees see that as fair and understand it as well. The third type of protection is that non-solicitation of employees, the anti-rating restrictions that you can put into contract terms. And I believe, and I'd be curious what others think as well, and Audrey, what you think, but I believe that every employee in an organization should have a restriction on a solicitation of their coworkers or former coworkers. You all invest in your employees, you are providing them training, you're bringing them on through orientation, you're giving them an opportunity to build their reputation and their skills and their career in your workplace. I think it's fair to say to them, we don't, we have enough of an interest in protecting our current employees that you can't raid them or solicit them when you leave our organization. States, for the most part, have allowed those types of restrictions to be in place. Again, those are the type of restrictions that are not covered by the FTC rule. And I think it's fair for all employees to have that restriction. And for all employees, you could have one simple document. It doesn't need to be overly legalese that has a confidential information restriction and has an employee non-solicitation restriction. That's one, maybe two pages of a legal agreement that you can use to bind that employee when they leave your organization in order to protect those interests that you have. For those individuals in your organization who are patient facing or resident facing or member facing and have that level of contact, whether it is the marketer at the hospice, whether it is some type of recruiting individual at the, um, at the um, healthcare facility, if they have that level of contact and that level of connection with your patients or residents, it's fair to have a time bound, reasonable with respect to the duration, restriction on them soliciting those patients or members or residents after they leave employment. I think that's especially fair for clinical direct care individuals in any kind of acute care hospital, long-term care facility, wherever it might be, if it's an RN, um, even to a level of, of other levels of nursing to the extent they have that direct patient care, I think it's fair to have a standalone agreement that restricts those individuals from soliciting those patients, those members, those residents that you have been serving. And most states have said that's fair, again, as long as it's reasonable with respect to the duration and to whom it applies. You want to make it narrow enough so that it's not applying to every patient in the hospital or every patient in the facility, but it might be restricted to those patients or those residents with whom the RN has worked over the last 12 months. And that's high, you know, reasonable with respect to the duration. It has a reasonable look back period with respect to the types of patients that it's restricting. And I think most courts would approve of that type of restriction if it makes sense for the individual employee 
for whom it applies. Again, the FTC rule won't apply to those types of restrictions for um, patients or residents or the members. And then the fifth type of geographic restriction, that is the one that's covered by the FTC rule. But again, as Audrey said, they did allow for it to stay in place for senior executives who have that policy making role, who are making more than that $151,000 salary threshold. And if you put them in place before September 4th, they should be acceptable under the FTC rule. You have to still make sure that they meet the individual state law requirements and, and that's always been the case. So that won't be anything new but consider whether those C-suite individuals within your organization are such that you do need to take steps to protect against them going across the street on the other side of the city or even within your service area, whatever that service area might be. They can still be reasonable. They still are fair for that level of policymaking senior executive and the FTC recognizes that if it's in place before September 4th or wherever the rule goes into effect, then that's acceptable and enforceable. So I see there's a couple questions that are popping in and again, um, please come, please continue to send them in. We'll come back to the idea of, of the written notice um, that you have to provide. I see there's a, a couple questions there. Um, we'll touch on some of the pending litigation that's coming up as well. Um, and then there's a question about whether the exemption that's limited to the C-suite or policymaking individuals um, could be um, could be made at the level of a VP or director level, uh, depending on their direct their whether their decisions influence the entire organization, and that that really is that that key factor of whether the decisions they're making on policy are impacting the entire organization, or whether they're just affecting a department or a subunit of the organization. In the FTC's rule, they say it needs to focus on the entirety of the organization. An individual with director level responsibility or VP level responsibility even, that you can't fairly argue isn't affecting the entirety of the organization is probably not exempt under the FTC rule. Another question that um, someone posed is with respect to early stage companies or other organizations that offer equity grants, whether or not those types of restrictions are going to be um, subject to the exception and allowed or covered under the FTC rule. Um, I think that's an area where the FTC has commented that they don't intend to cover those types of restrictions that are true equity based, um, again, for the most part, they're a fairly level balance of bargaining and the two individual parties that are, that are um, advancing with that decision to enter into the contract are such that they can make those decisions without um, the government kind of prohibiting them. So those types of equity grants are an area where both the FTC and even we'll talk a little bit about the National Labor Relations Board and other agencies have said are acceptable, are not covered by these types of So again, one of the questions was related to the current status of litigation with respect to the rule. And for those that I'm friends with on LinkedIn or connected with on LinkedIn, I commented shortly before the July 4th holiday that I did not expect either this FTC rule or the Department of Labor rule with respect to overtime regulations to survive the holiday and survive really the holiday weekend. Um, True to form, we got the decisions. All these decisions came out from the court system on July 3rd and on July 5th. We got the decision from a federal court in Texas with respect to the FTC rule. And although the court accepted the arguments from the plaintiffs that the rule was too broad, that the FTC lacked the authority from Congress to act on this type of area, and that the rule itself was pretty much arbitrary and capricious is what the judge said. The judge did not stay or enjoin or stop the rule for the entire country. The judge laid out the way and the path by which the plaintiffs could make that argument, the US Chamber of Commerce in particular, how they could try and argue that their members across the country are impacted and that 
the injunction that the court granted should apply to the entire country. But the court wasn't ready to do that on July 3rd, I think is when the decision came out. Um, the court has determined that it will attempt to make a decision on the merits before September 4th. And there's no doubt that the plaintiffs in that case and every other interested party is going to make a run at trying to convince the court that yes, the rule is such that it does impact not just the litigants in the state of Texas, but the entire country. And there's a lot of history, as you all probably know, with the Department of Labor overtime rules and other rules that have come out of previous administrations and even this administration, where one single district court in Texas will say it doesn't apply to the entire country. And we've seen that in other areas of employment law just in the last week as well with respect to um, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act and others. But for now, no court has said that the FTC rule doesn't apply and can't go into effect across the country. And, and that's significant. It's, it's, we're going to bump up against that September 4th deadline now, and um, it's going to be kind of a last minute thing again, which is unfortunate for purposes of business planning, but, but that's the way it's going to be. I'll go on the record again to say I will be shocked if this court doesn't enjoin the rule for the entire country by the end of August. But I was wrong before and, um, and very well might be, might be wrong again. Um, with respect to that, proactive steps that everyone should be taking are really just watch what the law, what happens with the law and how it develops. Um, you know, you wanna probably take steps to start preparing for the impact of the rule going into effect. Unfortunately, we don't have a decision as to whether it applies to, I'm guessing all of you, none of you are public employees in the state of Texas or that, that tax agency or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. But the, there are steps you can take in order to best prepare. Um, one, to the extent that you don't have them, think about entering into those geographic restrictions with your current C-suite, true policymaking senior executives. And you could start by just pulling the list of people who make over that salary threshold of the $151,000 or so and decide, do they have that level of policymaking authority? Do we want to try and put this in place? Do it as part of a retention package. Do it as part of a bonus that you provide, um, some equity grant, whatever it is, you have to give them something in exchange for them promising not to compete with some, within some geography. But if it's important to you as an organization, now is the time to take steps to put that in place. Take steps to put in place those patient resident member restrictions, those employee restrictions, and the confidential information and non-disclosure restrictions. Now, there's no real rush to do those before September 4th because the FTC rule won't affect those, but the time is right. Employees are thinking about this. Um, the economy is starting to turn better for purposes of unemployment. I just heard in a CNN story, I think it was this morning. But consider now what steps you might take in order to protect some of those interests that you have. And then I think, um, you know, start thinking about what you're going to do with respect to the requirement to provide notice to employees. The proposed rule had a restriction or a uh, notice requirement that you had to notify employees within 45 days of the date the rule went into effect. The final rule got rid of that. And a step that went the wrong way for us as employers, they now require that notice to go out as of the effective date itself. And that's going to leave a lot of people scrambling that last weekend into the September um, Labor Day holiday because that's a big um, burden. And the FTC took a bunch of comments. Like Audrey said, there were a lot of comments on the rule generally. They considered all of the, the questions around what exactly do we need to do for purposes of this notice. And some of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat are, are, are around that. You do have to provide notice to employees with current non-compete restrictions if the rule goes into effect, telling them it's no longer in effect. There's language that the um, FTC has provided that you can refer to. The rule does require you to look backwards to former employees with whom you have a restriction. There's not a lot of guidance on what that means. There are a lot of comments asking for more clarity. There's no time limit. There's not a one year or two year look back period that's required. 
the general rule is if you've got contact information for them and you think it is probably still good, you should send it to those former employees at that former contact. That's unfortunate, but that's another place where you might want to take some proactive steps, just prepare and plan for the potential to have to provide that notice to those employees. Um, I see a, co a comment or a question from one of our colleagues, Rufino Gatan, a wonderful attorney out of the, um, the Houston office of Hush Blackwell, um, asking, do we recommend that employers continue to use non-competes in the interim and then simply comply with the notices if the rule is not enjoined? I think that is the best path forward. If you have non-compete agreements in place with people who are not senior executive policymaking leaders, I think you continue to have them in place, continue to enforce them between now and September 4th or whenever the law goes into effect. And if the law goes into effect and if they are no longer appropriate, then you have to provide that notice. And you can comply with the rule if and when it goes into effect. Audrey, any other thoughts on the, the, the notice requirement? Because I know there's a, a couple questions here um, in the chat on that issue. Yeah, I think just in terms of the timing, I like, I know I think one person asked um, in terms of how far to look back. Um, it's more just in terms of whether or not the agreement would still be effective. So if it's still in place, instead of thinking about whether or not the agreement was a certain amount of years before, it just is, would the agreement still be in place? Um, so that's more the threshold question. If it would be in place, then you're contacting um the workers that have that the agreement is with um and in terms of how workers is defined it does include i know we have another question about um what workers includes and whether it includes in independent contractors or not and it does include uh independent contractors as well if that's who the non-compete agreement was with and it right. could also include volunteers too um so really that definition of workers um, is all encompassing. One good question we just had from another colleague here in the Madison, Wisconsin area was whether if you've got an agreement that has multiple levels of restriction, so it has a geographic non-compete along with a patient non-solicitation, along with an employee non-solicitation restriction, should you take steps to notify that individual that the whole thing is not enforceable or that just that geographic restriction is not enforceable? there i don't remember seeing any commentary specific to that issue from the ftc i would advise just give a notice that says the geographic restriction is no longer enforceable the other things are not covered by the the final rule and i think that's something that you can continue to rely on um, to ensure that those other types of restriction are still enforceable another question from um you know what looks like a physician group is whether or not partners that are subject to a geographic non-compete are subject to the final rule, um, whether or not those individuals who have an ownership interest in the organization are covered. The FTC does address that, not necessarily in a whole lot of clarity, but to the extent that your physician group or group of other providers like dentists or some other specialty are making decisions, if they're members of the board of directors, if they're annual meeting is such that they're really making decisions for the organization and they meet that salary threshold, I think you probably can fit them under that exception um, to the non-compete rule. After September 4th, you're probably in a tough spot to have those types of restrictions. And that, that sounds remarkable that you can't have a geographic restriction for a physician owner of a physician group that is obviously contracting with different service providers and with different acute care hospitals, but that's um, the direction that the FTC has gone. Not, they did, they provided a little clarity, they did address it a little bit, but, um, but um, not definitively. Um, a question um, that came in is, what are we recommending for uh, nonprofits that are not subject to the rule with respect to communication to employees? That's a, a very good, point and something that we should touch on. Um, I think it's fair to be direct with your employees. I still think that there is value that you as an organization have in protecting yourself as an organization from competition. 
And the way I like to frame it is we're protecting all of the people that you left behind. You don't say it this directly, of course, but you left our organization. But to the extent you take our patients, our residents, our members, our clients, our employees, you're threatening the lifeblood of that organization. If it's a small clinic and you're taking our nurse practitioners from us, that threatens our ability to serve patients. And frankly, that means we might not be able to pay those employees who are remaining. Um, and I think that's the type of messaging that that is fair and resonates. And frankly, that is the legitimate business interest you all have in putting these types of restrictions in place. I think it's fair to directly communicate with those individuals who have geographic restrictions in a nonprofit organization that they are going to remain in place. You are going to continue to enforce them. You see value in them and ask and, and open up a conversation with those individuals. Of course, if you decide not to proactively communicate, I think you can just be fair on the back end as you respond to questions that might come in. So we just have a couple more and, and, and we're almost done and we'll continue to address the questions after our, our stop time of one o'clock. But um, just another one of these quick polls, take a peek. Is your healthcare organization subject to the rules and policies and law that the National Labor Relations Board applies? Hopefully everyone's clicking that yes box. Responses are starting to come in somewhat slowly, but um, all of you are almost certainly covered by the National Labor Relations Board. And it's a little bit of a trick question because even if you don't have a labor union at your facility, the National Labor Relations Board, the National Labor Relations Act still applies to your organization. And Lately, in the last three years of this current presidential administration, the National Labor Relations Board has been much more um, active, active in the space of protecting individual employees who aren't in a union, who have never had a union in their workplace, from things that the National Labor Relations Board sees as protected concerted activity, labor-related kinds of issues like complaining about wages, or asking about um, restrictions on them from sharing information, confidential information restrictions. And in the last year, the National Labor Relations Board General Counsel, the staff of the National Labor Relations Board has said, non-compete agreements are a violation of the 50 plus year old National Labor Relations Act. Never been a violation in the past, but this current administration with the National Labor Relations Board has said, any non-compete agreement, even the proffering of a non-compete agreement is a violation of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, we're just starting to get decisions from the National Labor Relations Board, guidance from their enforcement agency um, kind of arm, as well as some of the administrative law judges about how they enforce that. And they've been dialing it back a little bit. They don't enforce it with respect to equity. So there's a recent decision from the, the administrative guidance arm of the National Labor Relations Board that said, if you're promising not to compete in exchange for equity, that's not something we're worried about at the National Labor Relations Board. But even employee non-solicitation restrictions, patient restrictions, customer resident member restrictions in the National Labor Relations Board mind might be something that is a violation of federal law. So again, even if you're a nonprofit organization, not necessarily covered by the FTC rule, it's important to keep all these different things in mind. And it's worth investing in time on the front end to make sure that your agreements are enforceable under whatever state law you're currently operating in. Because those um, state laws will continue to apply whether or not the FTC rule goes into effect or doesn't. The National Labor Relations Board and other federal agencies will continue to um, try and regulate non-compete agreements as well. And then finally, I'll just end with, and it goes back to this last question from a university, the best university in the world. What do you do with those employees? How do you communicate with them? What about the employment relations aspect of this? And that's something that um, I think that direct communication being upfront with employees is the best path forward, um, regardless of what happens over the next two months with respect to this rule. Um, last question. Hopefully we've had an impact and hopefully you're clicking that yes button again there. Are you interested in exploring new separate standalone agreements 
to protect those non-trade secret confidential information, employee um, non-solicitation restrictions. And again, I would encourage all of you to have those in place for every single employee and take steps to put those in place. Um, again, not something you need to do before September 4th or when the rule goes into effect, but I'd encourage it pretty soon. With that, we've hit one o'clock. Um, I think we've addressed most of those questions that were in the chat box. We will um, you know, follow up with questions if you've got them. If you wanna reach out to Audrey and I after the fact, we appreciate your attention here and we'll look forward as we move toward some decisions over the next couple of months. Thanks everyone.